So there's a line in the Neil Young song Union Man that says live music is better, bumper stickers should be issued. Now had I heard this song when I was a kid? No. But this was a constant refrain in my childhood because my dad would quote this all the time. And I wouldn't consider myself a Neil Young fan necessarily, I'm not really as familiar with his body of work as I am with a lot of artists, but every time I go to a concert I will still bring this up to my dad occasionally or he will bring it up when talking about music and it's kind of this shared quote between us and it kind of bridges this idea of how live music works and the energy in the room and all of this. It encompasses so much and I think that that sentiment, this idea of the magic of live music, the magic of performance, the magic of those ephemeral moments is central to Daisy Jones and the Six. And so today I want to talk a little bit about the book and a lot about the translation of the book to the show. Now I've read this book twice. I listened to the audiobook the first time. I just reread it. I bought it and had planned to like annotate it a little bit more or mark things and then I marked nothing. So we'll see how that goes. Or I guess we saw how that went. And this is the only Taylor Jenkins read I believe that I've read and honestly the only one I really have plans to at this point. But I'm really attracted to the form of the storytelling in this and particularly how that translates to the screen. Because if you've read the book you know and if you've seen the show you probably aren't surprised that the book is told in these like interview snippets in this kind of faux documentary style. It definitely gives the sense of a script. But even more importantly it kind of builds out this framework of this idea of a band that feels familiar. Whether we want to wade into what the line is between real person fan fiction and inspiration, that may be up for debate, but it does help build a scaffolding for this kind of reader experience, right? The thing about fan fiction on some level is that you are coming in with these kind of expectations and this kind of shared language about how these people behave, what the kind of given rules of the world are, even if we're putting that in a new world, all the characters slightly, what have you, we're starting from this kind of common language. And I think that this book does a lot of that as well. We're starting with this idea of what we know, what pop culture has told us about the rock and roll scene in the late 60s, the 70s, creeping into the early 80s. So we are starting with this idea, this framework, this scaffolding of what we know. And the thing about the book is it's taking the public facing of that story, the kind of what we're getting in an interview, the narrative that is being created around these artists about the art that lives so large in the zeitgeist. And then it's giving us these peaks into the personal. And in theory, we're still only getting the peaks of what these people are willing to tell us. So there's also this idea of are we being told the truth? What is the line between truth and fiction? myth and fiction? Who do we choose to believe in what moment and why? And how would a truth or the lie serve them differently? So there are these different layers of things, but it's all kind of centered around this idea of these artists that got together and created something magical. And so we're looking at artists outside of the kind of larger than life legends that have been built around them. And one thing that really struck me when rereading the book, because I listened to the audiobook around the time it first came out, and I had forgotten a lot. But what really struck me this time was this idea of these larger than life moments that kind of linger in the public consciousness and these moments of brief magic in these shared spaces but also the idea of how these narratives were built before the kind of snowballing of the stan culture on the internet and even kind of contrasting that with the stan culture of today and kind of the over analyzing of artists and it never really directly engages with those ideas against each other but it's hard not to draw those parallels to the current moment and the current context. So the book and the show are both following Daisy Jones and Billy Dunn predominantly as their lives kind of converge into this moment that leads to the kind of biggest album of the era for this band and how Daisy Jones as a solo artist ends up with the band The Six. But it's also analyzing these artists in the fullness of their messiness and I would argue that the book so far is doing that a little bit more than the show. So we're six episodes into the show and maybe I will regret kind of giving some thoughts before we're all the way done but I do think it's worth it to kind of sit here in this moment and look at them against each other and kind of the pacing and the trajectory of things because I think that they are largely abiding by the book in many places and if you've been with me for a second, you know that I don't actually mind changes for the sake of storytelling and cohesion. And sometimes I think those changes can be really interesting. And so these are subtler changes that I've 
haven't noticed. But I think that they are subtle changes that really compound for some big kind of narrative differences or the kind of emotional narrative core feels slightly different in the same way that songs are slightly different and lyrics have been switched. And I think one of the unique challenges of this project is the book can talk about this thing that exists so large within the pop culture moment of the book, right? This thing looms large. And so we are kind of able to transcribe, like I talk about with that fan fiction shared language, not saying this is necessarily fan fiction, don't get me wrong, but we're able to kind of project whatever that is for us onto the thing. There is a decent indication that it might be Fleetwood Mac's rumors, but again, if you were with me for the Rachel Hawkins book this year as well, you know that I don't really know the Fleetwood Mac lore, and I'm not here to make it about that. However, as a reader, we're able to bring the idea of this thing to our reading experience. And it may not be a defined idea, but there is this spirit of this piece of art that kind of transcends, that becomes a moment. And only so many pieces of art get to do that. And so trying to recreate that and create that moment is incredibly hard. You're having to kind of manufacture this thing that supposedly hit the kind of cultural consciousness and the right emotional beats and just hit everything at the right time. This is very much about the right piece of art at the right time while exploring the humanness and messiness, like I said, of the artists that create that art. And all that's to say the music is so central to things here and so what feels like a tiny change even in the music can pack a different impact. For instance, Tiny Love versus Searching for Sublime. It's the same reason that I could go on a long tangent about why I disagree with the choice to take out Someday I'll Fly Away from the Moulin Rouge musical. The subtle can mean something and there's lots of those like little compounding changes in the show. And while I'm fully enjoying myself so far and I'm really intrigued by some of the changes, there are others that are being made that I think are taking out some of that emotional messiness. And if you've been with me for a second, you've probably heard me talk about emotional messiness before. But I think the show has us on a trajectory with Billy and Daisy where it wants us as viewers to be somewhat engaged with that relationship in a way that I didn't feel it was as necessary in the book. And sure, people are definitely gonna be engaged with that relationship. If you've been with me for a second, you also know that I don't really like infidelity plot lines. And so you're probably like Melody, what the heck. But here's the thing, I thought that it was more intriguing in the book because it was handled from a different angle. It made it more about the kind of emotional struggle and the stakes of that honestly felt higher at times. But we were watching Billy struggle against things. We were watching Daisy struggle against things and spiraling. And all of it kind of leads to this pressure cooker of this album. So we're watching Billy and Daisy, yes, but we're also watching the fallout and everything around them. And I think that the characters around them, for me personally, were more interesting sometimes than Billy and Daisy, because Billy and Daisy is the story that we are familiar with. It's the kind of shorthand. We don't necessarily know how it's gonna fall out, but they are the vehicle for these larger ideas. And this probably sounds really vague right now, but kind of the characterization, particularly of Daisy and Billy, both feels familiar in the show and just like a tinge off. It feels in Daisy's case and a little bit in Billy's as well that it may be a little bit more curated imperfection than like real messiness. We do still have Daisy entering the scene young. We still have explorations of addiction from both Billy and Daisy but in a way that is incredibly toned down specifically in relation to the first tour and Billy's entering of rehab and part of that coincides with how the show is subtly changing the trajectory of the Six's career, of Daisy's career, and how they're just these little subtle changes but makes it more about how they both needed each other in that moment to become something big rather than them being kind of on this trajectory of being something big in their own right and the magic that they made together and how that elevated them to this completely new plane of artistry. But back to this idea of curated imperfection, all of this kind of weaves together. So apologies if I kind of jump around a lot. I think the biggest change to Daisy right out of the gate and one of the ones that feels the most significant is we see her distance from her parents parents, but we don't get the same sense of her being a Nepo baby, as we would call it today, and the privilege she's coming from, and also how that world orphans her in some ways. And we still see the kind of emotional implications of that, but we also have in the show a Daisy that works in a diner, 
which we would not have in the book. And so in some ways, I think that they are attempting to make Daisy more relatable. They have toned down somewhat the kind of extent of her addiction and drug use, though it is absolutely still there. And the same with Billy in some ways. And I struggle with this and I'm conflicted on this because absolutely the drug use in the book is uncomfortable, but it's supposed to be uncomfortable. It's not supposed to be glamorizing this lifestyle by any means. And as hard as it is to read about that in the book with the distance of these interviews and knowing that we're looking back on all of this, because the style of the book does give us the safety and distance of this all being in the past. And the style of the show is both. So I will swing back to the style and the sense of the interviews and how those work in the show because I was so, so excited to see them at all. One of my biggest fears and hesitations of the show is that it was going to remove the interviews because I thought that, that is what made the book so special. And so we'll swing back to that in terms of the context of the show. But by toning it down, we don't have to live in that in the same way. And I guess you can make the case that we do still have the interviews in the show. So in some ways, we do still have that distance. But I think it works differently because we are still living in those moments in the kind of acted bits, for lack of a better term. Obviously, the interviews are acted too. I know that. They're monologues. I get it. But we have to live with those characters in that moment. And I think that the show is much more concerned with making us as viewers sympathetic or rooting for Daisy and Billy in some way, whether it be for them separately, together, whatever it is, it wants us invested in them in a way that feels slightly different than the book. Though I don't know that I can fully articulate that. And so we have a Daisy that's working at a diner. And that just feels off to me, but it's also something I can get over. I do want to be careful too, because I don't want to discredit addiction. And in some ways, I think the choice to pull back from some of that or the depiction of some of that is an effort not to glamorize. However, by kind of pulling back on some of that, I think it actually glamorizes it more in some ways. We don't have the same kind of messy, desperate energy to these characters, or at least it's not reading to that fullness. It's still somewhat restrained. And I definitely think some of that is pacing. Especially Especially with the end of episode six, we are feeling things picking up. And I think that they may have pulled back in some ways. So there's somewhere for us to go narratively, because where we start in the book is already pretty extreme. And a lot of the rising tension is internal and that internal messiness. And so I think the show is going to be building that externally in an effort to kind of reflect that. So I definitely do think it's going to explore that. But I think it changes the tenor of Billy and Daisy's relationship at the outset. And I think there are lots of slight differences there. For instance, Billy's attempt to kind of leave the group in the show, which I think adds a nice little layer of resentment for Eddie, because in the book, he just kind of is frustrated and pouting in the corner about not having as much creative control, which I get from artists too. But for storytelling, it makes more sense. I don't love the angle of throwing on a crush on Camilla with that as well. But it also makes more sense. I think in terms of Camilla, both the book and the show are both fighting against this idea of the muse and trying to complicate that. Because because I think Camilla is probably one of the most interesting characters in both. And both are kind of playing and complicating the idea of her staying, even if the end of the book is a little bit frustrating in terms of her journey. And so Daisy has a line that's, I'm not the muse, I'm the somebody. And she's kind of constantly struggling and wanting to be the somebody. I think she's honestly striving a little bit more in the book. I think that in the book, her struggling with the kind of direction that the record producers want to push her in and all of this is honestly a lot more interesting than the kind of trajectory they have her on the show. This idea that being around the six is her first big break. I like the idea that she is somebody before she enters the group. Of course, she's somebody before she enters the group, but you know what I mean. And so the show is playing with this idea of Camilla. And I think it's hard because I think that they are both building her out more and less at the same time. They are giving her something to do with the photography. I love the idea that she is actually the one to catch that album shot and that she is seeing this relationship relationship differently through that lens. I think it's active. I think it's interesting. I think we see her making choices. I also think that they take away some of her moments. For instance, her ultimatum to Billy that he either comes up and meets Julia or he goes to rehab. Because in the show, it's not really Billy's choice either. I do think it was altered to Teddy making that decision to kind of show him as more of a father figure. So I kind of get it. But I also think that there was something incredibly profound in that moment for Camilla as a new mother. And yes, we still get that moment of her catching him on tour, but it's different. And also, also, the way that whole tour was filmed was so different. For one, it felt much smaller scale than the sense of it I got in the book. For instance, they're still in the van rather than on a tour bus. Additionally, this is the moment that everything for Billy traces back to in terms of everything he is fighting for the rest of his life. And we see so little of that spiral. Now, granted, I don't want to live in that. 
I didn't want to see it, but I think narratively we needed a little bit more. Yes, he looked absolutely rough on that stage in that last shot. We got the sense of him floundering, but we didn't really get to see him completely fall. And I think it's because the show wanted us narratively to still be sympathetic to him and still have room for him to kind of climb back up and for us to like him. But I think what is really interesting about Daisy and Billy and this whole world is they are so complicated. They're not necessarily always likable people, but they are complicated, flawed people seeking something, seeking to do better, seeking to find a voice, seeking to feel something in this really chaotic world. And so this gets to kind of two things, the chaoticness of the world. And I've talked about that kind of chaos being tamped down in terms of both Daisy and Billy. But I also think we see that chaos kind of tamped down in some other ways. By not seeing the fullness of that tour, we are still kind of claustrophobic in the world we've created here. And we're not getting a sense of what the other bandmates are up to at this time. We're seeing what Billy costs them in terms of the cancellation of the tour and whatnot, but it would also show the kind of whole world of this more. What is that allure of that moment of performing? What is that moment of transcendence when you're under those lights and that chaos is kind of controlled for you in that moment? And to be fair, the world of the book is pretty insular too, but we do get these kind of moments, these hints of the chaos on the outside. For instance, in the show, Chuck leaves because he wants to become a dentist. In the book, he is shipped off to Vietnam and he dies. I think we might get a reference to Vietnam in the show. And going back to the idea of messiness for a second, even in the show there is a line about no one needing reminding the world is a mess. But I think as a viewer, I think some of us do. There are a lot of people watching the show that aren't aware of everything that was going on around this. And I do like that the soundtrack kind of brings us through time with the music, but we are skipping lots of time in this as well. So I think some more indicators, I don't need like a history lesson by any means, but I think a a little bit more of that mess, a little bit more of that chaos. We've got a kind of controlled chaos right now, and absolutely it still needs narrative control and we still need to be able to build to something, but I think that there's just a little bit of opportunity for tweaking there. Because I do think that the storytelling in this is really interesting, but I don't know that the show kind of translates that full frenzy of the outside world and how that was kind of funneled into music, how that was kind of a lightning rod to kind of purge some of these emotions. And granted, I did not grow up in this time, I haven't fully studied, I took one class on the six that went from like 55 to 75 when I was in college. So I don't know the fullness of everything clearly. But as someone who likes music and who was raised around the Stones and the Kinks and Lou Reed and Elvis Costello and the Stray Cats and all of that, there is this sense of that emotional kind of purging and how you can kind of funnel all of that chaos into the art, right? What is being an artist? And so by not having that messiness to its fullness that surrounds everything, it doesn't allow for the art to fully transcend either. Which also brings us back to this idea of Camilla and Camilla as the muse and this idea that Billy is writing songs about and for his wife and more importantly for the life he wants and the person he wants to be. And so by not seeing that struggle as much, that doesn't carry as much weight. It's easier then for us as viewers to default to Daisy's side and be like, of course, why are you being so sentimental writing songs for your wife when that is kind of a transcendent act for him as well. And also by not seeing the fullness of that messiness, we're not seeing the fullness of the relationship between Billy and Camilla. And I do think the show is teasing that out a little bit more. I would love to get some more interviews with Camilla to kind of balance that out. I think in the book she's given a little bit more philosophical ponderings about like what it means to love, what it means to stay, what it means to fight for something. And I think it would be so easy to kind of trivialize that, but that's not the point of her. And I do appreciate what they're doing with her, even as I think they could have pushed it or can push it a little bit more and I think we're building to something in the second half of these episodes, absolutely. But I'll be interested to see what that something is because I do think that she is one of the most interesting characters in this. Now one of the changes that I find most interesting with Camilla and what I do think adds a lot of dynamism to what is going on is her kind of pushing for Daisy to join the group because then she is the kind of eye of everything and we're seeing this a lot in the show, her being the eye and her having a much bigger hand in things and we see this in the book when Karen is talking about how she kind of has this ability to get her way without forcing her way. And here we're seeing her get her way in terms of knowing that Daisy can take them to the next level, knowing that there is something there. We see this even when they're starting out, making calls and helping the band in many ways. She is part of the six. She is part of this group, of this family, as she calls it. And so then as Daisy is kind of becoming more central to things and she starts feeling pushed to the side, that's a much more interesting exploration, especially
especially as that is combined with motherhood, which in the book we know Camilla wants. And I think that the exploration of that and wanting or not wanting of motherhood will be further explored in the second half if you've read the book and if we follow the book, I guess I should say. But we've already seen some of that teased with her talking to Daisy at the photo shoot and meeting Julia for the first time. Not the first time, the second time presumably. And so even with Camilla, who is most likely kind of narratively and socially to be kind of pigeonholed in that muse stereotype, we see her kind of defining narratives. She made this band in many ways, and she can see them in a way that others can't through her lens, as we see in the photo shoot. So these things that feel like very subtle changes, her making some calls on behalf of the band, her taking pictures, are very, very different for things. And also by making her a photographer, she has her own dreams that she's chasing. There's that line in the show about, do you think I moved here just for you or to follow you? Maybe this is just now a Camilla appreciation video. I don't know. But I really appreciate the kind of building out of her storyline in these subtle ways. I also really, really appreciate the building out of Simone's storyline. And I hope that we get to see a lot more of her in the second half, especially because I would like to see more of the disco scene at the time. I think that that would be a lot of fun. I think that there's ways they could push her storyline even more. I do think that we're seeing some of the struggles that Daisy had in the book in terms of sound, though she was kind of battling the studio with what sound they wanted from her versus wanting to create her own sound and be a songwriter, whatever. And here we have Simone who's kind of searching for a sound and finding her voice. And I think that that is really interesting. And I also think it's interesting showing these kind of different musical styles, this fact that she's in the same world, but in a different world at the same time. So absolutely more Simone I would love. And I do think that they're kind of showing this tension between like rock and roll and how people view rock and the storytelling and the songwriting and the artistry of rock with these other forms. For instance, we have this kind of bit with Caroline, this girl Graham is seeing and liking pop. And she says something along the lines of, it just makes me happy. And Graham and Karen kind of roll their eyes at that. And I think that if we got a better sense of what drew them to rock in the first place, then it would feel a little less snobby. We'd understand them a little more. Maybe they are supposed to feel snobby in that moment too, though. I don't know. But it is an interesting dynamic. This also brings us to the changes in Graham and Karen's storyline, which are some of my least favorite changes in the show. So let's touch on that briefly, I guess. So Karen is another kind of iteration of this muse versus a somebody idea. She's been kind of jumping from bands to find the band that she thinks is going to make it, which is really interesting in the trajectory of the show in terms of why she stayed with them so long, because they haven't made it in the same way that they had in the book. There had been these kind of indicators of success in the book. There was this sense that they were climbing up something. And here it feels a little bit more like slow build to that sudden success once Daisy and Billy are together and create this kind of magic, which again in the book it was more this kind of idea of transcending to this new level of artistry, this kind of magic in a bottle in this moment, but that they are still great artists independently, which they are, absolutely. But going back to Karen, it's this idea that she doesn't want to be known as the musician's boyfriend, that she is great in her own right, and that is what she values, she's worked so hard for. And so in the show we're seeing Graham attracted to her from the very beginning, which we also know from the book. But in the book, this is spoiler alert, this is all spoiler alert, who am I kidding? I mean, I'm going to try and not spoil things that happen in the end of the book, but up through episode six anyway. So in the show, they're kind of dancing around this attraction. Camilla kind of catches on to things, tries to push them together, but they keep kind of pulling back. Or Karen keeps kind of pulling back. And then Graham starts seeing this other girl and they get together almost out of Karen's jealousy in a way. And in the book, they're like on tour and like emotions are high. Adrenaline is running. They're having the time of their lives. And they're on the phone for some reason at the hotel. And Karen is basically just like, well, why haven't you hit on me yet? And Graham says something along the lines of, I'm not going to take a shot that I don't know is a sure thing. And Karen is basically like, and again, really paraphrasing here, it's a sure thing. And then we see Graham kind of running down the hallway. And then they're having like this extended affair on tour while everyone is more distracted with kind of what's going on with Billy and Daisy. So I just like the energy of that and I like the idea of getting together basically in this like showman's atmosphere and then having to see if that will translate to real life if it goes beyond tour. I think that there's something really interesting there so I don't know. I don't know how I'm feeling about the Karen and Graham relationship in the show. I'm reserving full judgment because I know that by the end of the storyline if they follow it, I'm gonna want to punch somebody by the end. I'll also be interested to see, because they've changed the trajectory of the beginning of the relationship, how the rest of the relationship is impacted by that, and whether the storyline continues with similar beats, 
or is changed. I don't know, obviously, because we're only on episode six. But I think that the way that they're looking back on everything through the interview sections is really interesting because I was so, so excited to see that we were still doing this in the kind of interview format, but I somehow think it's missing something. It seems to be playing in this space of, well, what have the others told you? Or the idea that the kind of acted out bits, the flashbacks, the kind of narrative heart of everything is the in-between of what they're not saying. And in the book, like I said before, some of the most interesting bits are where the interviews contradict each other or where we know something from someone and someone else is trying to tell us something and we know it's not true. Now, granted, we have to choose who we're believing in that moment. And then we could see where people were holding back themselves based on what other people said, but there were always these like kernels of truth. And we're trying to find the kernels of truth. In the show, just by the narrative form, we have to pick a definitive kernel of truth of some kind. Now, we're watching this be different for different characters, right? We're seeing Billy say, well, what did she tell you? We're seeing Daisy kind of have this knowing look in her eye in the kind of modern interview setup. But there is still in that flashback some definitive. And I think where it's the most interesting is where it does kind of contradict the interview or kind of undermine the interview in some ways. The character is telling us something about their emotional reality or kind of trying to paint the picture of what was going on in a certain way. And then we're being shown as viewers something slightly different. And I think that, like I said, is its most interesting, but it's also kind of a stumbling block. It's easier to paint kind of wide swaths in interview recollections. It's easier to kind of reference momentous moments and make them loom larger, like Daisy and Billy's writing sessions. These moments pack a big emotional punch. They're doing a lot of the work in terms of navigating these characters and moving them to a different emotional point, but then we're not just looking back on something and saying, oh, that was a big deal. We have to try and make it feel like a big deal as it's happening, if that makes sense. And like I said before too, I think in the music, this is where it's the hardest. You've got something that's kind of larger than life in a way, and then you have to distill that and make it an actual thing, and then make it a thing that sounds like it belongs in the time it's taking place as well. And I don't know how I feel about the soundtrack of this yet. I think it's gonna continue to grow on me. I think I'm definitely gonna enjoy watching musical bits of things as I always have. But for me right now, the music isn't necessarily transcending in the way that I thought it might or hoped it might, especially when I've heard little bits, I think, from actors where they were asked if they'd be willing to tour in their audition. I don't know. Would I go to a show of this? Probably, but more for the novelty as much as anything. And I will be really interested to see how the music translates to the stage, right? Because we are kind of saving the moment and the magic of the stage. We got this one kind of like big festival performance of Honeycomb, which I refuse to call anything else at this point, but we haven't really seen the full magic of things. I presume because we're saving those stage pictures. We need the moment to feel different. For the same reason we saw so little of that first tour, I think, though I still think we could have seen a little bit more. If we'd done like a super cut of like an early song and seen a little bit more variety in what was going on there, had a little bit more sense of movement to things, watching things kind of spiral. We didn't need to linger in anything too long, but I think there was potential there. And there was also the potential, like I know we're seeing the growth of the performance venues from like the small stage in the club on the Sunset Strip to the kind of desert festival to where we'll end up at Soldier Field. So I get that we're trying to build like different tones and spirits of things, keep things visually interesting, keep things narratively interesting. But I think that there was a way to do that. I think that there was a way we could build out different color palettes. The tours could feel different in different ways. We're spinning different storylines. I just don't know if we're in that same kind of emotional spot for the second half that I know is gonna put us through it. And I know it's gonna put us through it in the second half because there's that moment where Daisy kind of looks at the interviewer and said, you know, I know I said I would tell you everything, but how much of everything do you really want to know? Or was it Billy that said that? But that tells me we're still going to get messy. And of course we are, because we have to get to that climax. We have to get to that emotional fallout. Now what that emotional fallout is going to look like, I'm not sure. Because I feel like we're being a lot more overt with the relationship between Billy and Daisy in this in a way that I don't know if I like or not. We have Daisy kind of straight up telling Billy how she feels. We have Billy kissing her to get her back on the mic. And I just don't know how I feel about it. Now I know that that bit was emotional manipulation. And then we see the fallout of that emotional manipulation. We see Daisy reacting to it, realize that's what it is, etc. However, in the book, we see this push and pull between them. They keep referring to them 
as kind of like like souls in many ways. And how that they are so alike is both good and bad because they can create this art together, but they're not necessarily the best for each other. And we see Daisy kind of tempting Billy in a lot of different ways. Now, do I like that Daisy is described again and again in the book as gorgeous and as a redhead? Absolutely. Do I love that she is basically a stand-in for temptation for Billy and as a redhead? I could leave it, but you know. Then again, Daisy also fights back, which you know what? I'm not going to think about it too hard. Anyway, I like in the book this kind of subtle push and pull. This idea, like I said before or alluded to before, this idea almost of emotional infidelity. That they are drawn to each other but they know they shouldn't be and they try to fight against it, which almost makes it worse somehow, but it definitely makes it more interesting. So in some ways, while I feel like they are succeeding in complicating things like Camilla or even Eddie's resentment of Billy, I think that they are slightly failing in the nuances that they could be exploring, whether it's about Billy and Daisy's relationship at the center of things, whether it's about the kind of messiness that surrounds everything. I think that right now the show is kind of holding back. And whether that's because it's going to push it into gear in the second half, which I absolutely think it will, and it wants to have a kind of more natural crescendo to the emotional climax of everything, which yes, I do think it's trying to do, but I think that there were opportunities or I think that they could still accomplish that while still delving a little bit more into the messy here. And I'm not pretending that it's not messy, but like I said, it feels like it's holding back somewhere. It feels like in Daisy and Billy's relationship in particular, there are opportunities to explore more of the subtleties and that push and pull. And I think there are opportunities to explore more of those subtleties in everything, honestly. And I don't even know that it would be that hard to do. I think that it would be adding more interviews in that kind of contrast what's going on, that kind of call into question what's going on. I think they're playing on that idea already, but I think there's the opportunity to play with it even more. In some ways, I'm still just ecstatic that they're using the interviews at all because I don't know why I had myself convinced they wouldn't. But I wasn't going in with a whole lot of hope. I'm not gonna lie to you and I don't know why. But overall, I am still enjoying myself. I think it is making its changes subtle enough that they are still distinctive in the storytelling. It's showing that they're thinking about the shape of the storytelling for sure, but it's subtle enough that it doesn't feel like a complete deviation from the book. And so it still feels familiar for readers while playing with this idea of the story they want to be telling. At the same time, I do think in some ways it's playing it a little bit safer in the book. And there are places that it probably should play itself a little bit safer. For instance, building out Camilla and giving her more to do. There are characters like Camilla who definitely deserve to be drawn out even more, but I will be interested to see how all of this carries into the second half and what shape the storytelling takes, if the changes kind of continue to be subtle, or if we're going to compound enough that it feels pretty different while still hitting kind of those bigger narrative beats. I will be very interested to hear what everyone's thinking about this. I know I kind of jumped all over the place with this, so apologies for the scatteredness of the thoughts here. But if you've read, watched both, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on this so far. Thanks as always for hanging out and listening to mine. Like and subscribe if you feel like it. Read something good. And yeah.